straight down, like basically I think we counted like 36 people still love the Lord to become part. And I know there's other ones that talk to us afterwards. I tell you, it was it took me a minute to kind of just kind of gain my composure with that. Because I was excited someone like took a picture of me and they're like, man, your head must have been hurting all this kind of just even to be honest with you. Just uh, thankful for that. And uh, the ongoing joke is people partner or join a church and then buy. You don't see them for a while. And so I'm grateful people came back. It's good. No more come back. Well, anyway, we want to pray. And if you're here earlier, sorry that the color scheme is not exactly the same. I know some of you are like that. Purple is supposed to be here. I was glad to as far as I could. If you came in earlier, that accidentally said Luke, which totally makes some people go, you know, so I'm sorry. I got it right now. But anyway, let's pray, and uh, we'll get started. God has come to you again tonight and say, Great are you, Lord. Yes. Lord, as the song said, it's your breath in our lungs. So, God, we pour our praise to you and to you only. And, Lord, I thank you for the people who's come out tonight. Lord, I know the weather's not exactly what we would like. But, God, thank you for the rain. And, uh, Lord, just pray as we study this book, God, that you would really just uh, give me wisdom to explain things I can. Lord, maybe bring things to mind that I did not already have written down. Uh, Lord, maybe take things away you don't want me to. But Lord, I pray you meet everybody in their need tonight where they're at. You help them. And we just thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to jump into the book of Acts tonight. So we have walked through the first four Gospels miraculously, or probably very simplistically, did one Gospel a night. And every time I get to it, I say, oh, well, good, we're past Luke. John won't be that hard. Yeah. Then he gets past John, and I was like, how am I going to do Acts? And I won't lie to you, I don't even know if I'm going to think about Romans uh, for a moment, or really a lot of them. Corinthians, all those things. A lot of great books coming up. Uh, I will say this about the book of Acts as we get started. Acts still serves as, well, we kind of, you divide up the New Testament kind of in a historical setting, if you remember from that first week. Because it gives, uh, you know, all the accounts of the life of Christ. And, and Acts is kind of serves as a very much a transitional book. Very much as a transitional book as you go from the life of Christ into, into the church. So, um, when we look at the author, again, the author being Luke, the beloved physician. Um, I just put on there, see your notes on the Gospel of Luke. If you didn't get to see Luke or weren't here for that, we have it online. Or you probably look for somebody to make a copy of it for you. A lot of information about uh, Luke. I mentioned even this morning uh, that Luke was not a disciple. And Luke was a Greek. And the fascinating thing about that is, again, if you look at the New Testament, how God is now, is to the Jews first, but also to the Greeks. And how Jesus and his ministry starts to spread out to those that are Gentiles, which, by the way, thank God for, because I is one, and more than likely you are too. Uh, you're, you say, well, I don't know, am I really a Gentile? If you're not a Jew, guess what? Uh, if you're, you're a Gentile, you may learn something about your own self there tonight. But he is the only non-Jew to write any of the New Testament, which is fascinating uh, in that. Uh, kind of reminds me, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, of God bringing in people like Ruth in the Old Testament, like Rahab in the Old Testament, those who were not Jews, who were not Hebrews in that way. Uh, we believe he joined Paul uh, at Paul's ministry in Troas. You get that in chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. And the reason I say that is believing that Luke wrote it uh, is this whole idea, if you'll note the change, up to that first 16 chapters, it all says they. They did this. They preached there. They were cast in prison. They were there. And when you get to chapter 16, it changes to we. So now you get Luke being a participant in all the different things uh, that are going on. So some of you may not care about that, but that just kind of shows that. He traveled with Paul in his different missionary journeys. He went from Paul to the city of Philippi, and where Paul started a church there. Um, again, I don't know if it'll be this Sunday, but... Probably within the next month, we're going to start our next sermon series through the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books that we have. And uh, it's actually said that after he went with Paul to Philippi, that Luke stayed there for six years and worked and ministered, even pastored 
Uh, there's some in the church there for six years before later he joins Paul in Rome. Okay? So, I know I kind of laughed a little bit. Of all the books of the Bible we've done so far for the date, I normally give you a number and we just keep going and having a good time. I might say something else. The reason I did this is to give you some understanding of it. Is it's believed to be written around 61 AD while Paul's on house arrest. So it's believed that after the time that he spent in Philippi, Luke left with the elders, with people there, and he went to help Paul. Paul was under house arrest for at least two years, some say three, but uh, he was under arrest. This is not his ultimate arrest, but he was there uh, under arrest there, and uh, so he goes there to serve with him. You say, well, why uh, would you say it's that? Why isn't it much later that you read about that? Well, you have to understand, there's no mention of certain historical things. If you like history, like I like history, you would think at that point in time, some of these major things would have happened. There's no mention of the burning of Rome, which is a huge thing in, in, in that time period. There's also no mention of Paul being martyred, which happens a few years later uh, in that. In fact, next week, uh, I plan on taking that board over there and pretty much from Acts all the way through uh, the book of Jude, because Revelation is its own date and timeline itself. I'm going to kind of give you a timeline of Acts all the way through the book of Jude there, just to kind of give you when things happen, different things there. Uh, Paul and Peter are both believed to be uh, martyred or executed around 67 AD. Uh, and then also you have the destruction of Jerusalem, which happens at 70 AD. So if it happened later, you would think Luke, who, by the way, doctor, given the detail, given to a lot of detail, wouldn't have left out those major things there for you. Uh, with that. So if you want to argue with somebody, maybe I gave you something fun there to do at the holiday uh, with that. So wanted you to see that as far as the author and the date of that. Uh, the occasion of the book, uh, the book is also, it's called a lot of things. It's called the uh, Acts of the Apostles. Maybe your Bible says that. Maybe it says the Acts of the Apostles. It's also known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, to prep this a little bit, people stay away from Acts a lot of times because Start talking about the Holy Spirit and things get weird. Okay, so I'm just going to show you Bible things later to understand. I do find the importance to say this. I know occasions, purpose, and I'll get into that. In the Old Testament, before Christ comes, the Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is active. In Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let us make man in our own image. Uh, when he says, let us, there's got to be more than one for us. Okay, so God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all present at creation. Uh, we get the incarnation, the Father, excuse me, the Son in flesh in Christ, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us as we saw God the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, and this is kind of important for you to know because especially as people argue about, well, you can lose your salvation, you can lose your salvation. Look at people in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, the Bible would say the Spirit of the Lord would come upon somebody and empower them. But a lot of times when they rejected God or turned from God, the Holy Spirit would leave. I'll give an example, King Saul. King Saul, the Spirit came upon him and the Holy Spirit left. Probably the most famous one is Samson. Again, I don't think Samson was 295, six foot seven, and could turn and do all those things and the muscle grip. I really think Samson was an average Joe in that. Because it says it was miraculous the things that he was able to do in those things. But if you remember, Remember when, remember the, the long hair, the Nazarite vow, all those different things, uh, which by the way, just throwing it out on the side, of, I know I'll get into it some other time. Uh, there's different famous Nazarites in the Bible. Uh, people argue about them. It's okay, I just throw them out there. People can have fun. Uh, Samson's one of them, you know, the long hair, don't touch the certain things, don't drink the other things. Is it uh, Samuel, one, Samson, one, the Apostle Paul, John the Baptist, and many believe Christ was as well uh, in that. And, and so with Samson, if you remember, it says that when he told a lot of the secrets, you cut, you know, lay your head on my lap, baby, I'll take care of you, it cuts the hair. Uh, do you remember it says, and he got up and he wist not or he knew not that the Spirit of God had left him. And so in the Old Testament, all I have to say is, is that the Holy Spirit would come upon a person and leave a person. In the New Testament, when Christ, and you see the kind of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That, remember, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. Jesus says, and the Comforter will come. If I stay, the Comforter doesn't come. 
And, and so he leaves, the Holy Spirit comes. So we talk about when we put our faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us now. So now it's not the fear of the Holy Spirit leaving us. What does Paul constantly tell us to do? Quench not. Quench not the Holy Spirit. He said walk in the Spirit, right? You know, feed the Spirit. You know, those different things. Be filled with the Spirit. So those things, I just wanted to mention that to you. And again, I know a lot of good people I'm friends with, they argue about things with that. I just want to lay that out. But I want to give you kind of some points here about the occasion of the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is just a continuation of the teachings of Jesus Christ while he was on earth. Okay, so to give you an idea, when you end, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, when you end the book of Luke, and by the way, y'all do this sometime. Y'all read the book of Luke, Skip John, I know that's not blasphemy, skip John, go right into Acts. Same author, he goes right into it, okay? He, he ends with um, the Holy Spirit, oh, excuse me, he ends with this idea Luke does about uh, Christ and the Great Commission and him ascending. And when you read Acts chapter 1, what is it about? It, it starts with what? The Holy Spirit, oh, excuse me. Jesus taking them out. They were seen in 40 days of him after he was resurrected. For 40 days, he spoke with them, different things. And then he's a city he's taken up out of their sight there. And then you get to chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down. So it's a continuation of that. It's just a good way to read it. It's just my opinion again. Uh, and also, you see in Acts, you see the promise that Christ gave that what the Father would send the Holy Spirit, or what we see as the Comforter. You see that in John chapter 14, verse 25 through 31, where he talks about how the God of this world, he says, but fear not, talk about the peace that the Comforter will bring. That the Comforter will bring. And there's just so many things there that you can see in that passage in John 14. And we're not going to take time to read all of it uh, in that, so... But anyhow, just to kind of, a lot of great things is talking about how the Holy Spirit will come. Secondly, the book of Acts covers about 30 years. It's pretty impressive when you think about it. Now, it's a lot of history. Acts is one of those books that you've heard me say before. It, was it, any of y'all here whenever we did our series of the book of Acts? It's been a long time ago. Okay. Cool, I can do it again. Uh, I love that. You like to feel that's got 28 chapters. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, we might be there. But, uh, but it covers 30 years. But Acts is a great book. But there's something to do with Acts. Acts is written, and you have to understand what is called prescriptive and descriptive. Descriptive means this. They're describing, Luke is describing what happened. This is what happened. And Judas went and hung himself. Okay, that's telling you what happened. Prescriptive means this is something I need to take and apply to my life. So it's not like you flip through the Bible and it's God, I need you to give me a word, and Judas went and hung himself. All right, very good. That's what he told me to do. I got to do it. You understand what I mean? You have to be able to discern between prescriptive and descriptive uh, in those things. And so in understanding those things. So it's a really a transition book. And, and a lot of people necessarily don't like this language, but here's. Here's kind of what you want to see. The gospel primarily preached to the Jews. Now, when you get to the book of Acts, especially when you get about chapter 13 on, it kind of leaves the Jews. It kind of leaves them. Because you remember, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children, our children's children. And so you kind of see a moving away from... The uh, it's all about Jews, all about Jews, all about Jews. You see them moving away of that. And if I may say it like this, you almost see a leaving or a shifting, maybe, of Israel, 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 to now the church. Right? So if we're part of the body of Christ, neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision or uncircumcision, Christ is all. <coughs> That there is no advantage to being a Jew. Now, there is no advantage in that. Because now we are all part of the body of Christ, which Acts is full of, and a lot of letters are full of. We just mentioned Galatians, which is the Jews have a serious problem with the Gentiles not being Jewish, you know, in the body of Christ. So you kind of see a little bit of a leaving there uh, of that. And so the gospel, like the primary purpose of the Jews, but as more as you see the Gentiles say, the church becomes kind of distinct from Judaism. It's like, the Jewish custom and culture is no longer the, the dominant thing now. 
Which, by the way, be thankful. But the other thing is this. Remember at one point, and this blows my mind, when it talks about the ascension of Christ, I wasn't necessarily there, obviously, but give or take, Jesus talked to 11 guys. We're here because of what those 11 guys and probably the women that also were very much a part of the ministry there with it. Amen. We're here because of their a handful of people, men and women. They say, what about 12? Judas is gone by then. Acts, you actually get the putting up a new uh, disciple, Matthias, uh, becomes the new disciple uh, there of that. And uh, so anyhow, just, just knowing that there's so much, I've got to keep moving uh, with it. But anyhow, number three, I put this down for the occasion, is you see some doctrines that are later developed in other epistles, other letters, like Galatians, Ephesians, all those different things. You really see them in seed form in the book of Acts. It's the first time you kind of see them. Uh, the Old Testament, which, by the way, not to get off on this, some people don't like the Old Testament, but I always say that the Old Testament is in seed form. What the New Testament is in fully developed, bloomed. Yeah. Uh, and really, Acts is kind of a little bit of a microcosm of that. You see the beginning of such doctrines that you haven't seen up to that point, and then you see them developed and improved upon uh, from there. Uh, you get the, of course, the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 8. We'll go over that in a little bit. You get the Institute of Deacons in uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Uh, elders, uh, Gentile salvation. You say, what do you mean, Gentile salvation? Well, we'll talk about a little bit. There's this huge council that meets together, and they said, all right, some of them are arguing. Okay, they trusted Christ, but they've got to do this law, I've got to do this law, I've got to do this, and they finally come to the decision that, you know what, no, we can tell that Christ has saved them. We can see in them. They don't have to adhere to that. Now, they do kind of shake their finger at us and stay away from Bible, stay away from this, stay away from all this different things, but you kind of see how salvation is by grace. And, and I put this down here like this. Maybe it's a better way of saying it. It really emphasizes the practice of doctrine, not just the statement of doctrine. Remember the Pharisees? They knew the rights and wrongs and all the things they should do. Remember, Jesus says, he says, you strain at a gnat, you even know how to, to tithe of the, the smallest degree of your, of your spices. But yet you have the Son of Man in front of you and you will not receive him. So it's the idea of not just the statement of what doctrine is, but the practice, the living of it. It's probably we talk about it's practicing what you preach is living instead of just saying it. And I think we all could agree we been guilty of and been around people that can quote the Bible to you but don't live the Bible in front of you. And we could say the same thing. But also the last thing, I didn't mean to make it so small, I just ran out of board. You really see a lot with Paul's missionary journeys, really, you really see a great pattern for missions. Uh, not all missions is the same. Obviously, and that you see a great pattern for that, but you also see a great pattern for the church, how God desires the church to be set up uh, in that. So those are some different things I just wanted you uh, to see there, and I'm going to erase it. No, I'm kidding. I'm just going to move this right over here. So those are some different things there, and then I'll bring over this board. Everybody still doing okay? okay. And again, if I'm confusing or anything at all, just let me know if you have any other questions. Uh, with that. Uh, so let's go to the outline of the book. I want you to know that's the smallest outline I could physically do for 28 chapters. It's got about everything from Jesus being ascended to Pentecost to Paul getting snake bit to raising Dorcas from the dead to demon possessed women and all that. And some of y'all like tell me about that. I need to know none. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay. But I mean, there is, if you like excitement, Acts is your book, okay? It's pretty exciting uh, with that. Uh, so I kind of broke it down like this. And I want to read this verse to you, and I know it's one of our verses later. But uh, if somebody might read Acts 1 8, it is like the key verse for the whole book, in my opinion. Brother Johnny, you might read that? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you should be witnesses of who? Uh, me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea. And in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. So if you thank you, if you see this, the way this book kind of develops, it's Acts 1-8. I mean, it starts all about Jerusalem. It's all about the early church. And uh, it's kind of the joke. It's kind of like if you ever really want to know about mega churches, maybe you see a really interesting thing that he does here. 
Because here's that he wanted to what? He wanted to scatter, right? And the church at Jerusalem, First Baptist of Jerusalem, whatever you want to call it, all right? The church at Jerusalem, whatever you want to call it, okay? All right? I'm just joking about First Baptist or whatever, okay? But the idea is here, he said, go in all the world. And all these people are coming to faith in Christ. And all these people from all tribes and tongues and religions and things are being saved. And they're making this huge church. I mean, it says like over 5,000 souls. Like, don't get me wrong. I love 36 today. We didn't have a Pentecost service, but I'm pretty pumped about it. It's kind of like my version of Pentecost, okay, with that. All right? I'm playing to be Peter. But anyhow, so maybe in some of the bad ways. But anyhow, so, um, I mean, they had this thousand people when Jesus is like, scattered. Everybody needs to hear this. Everybody needs to hear this. And so you see Christianity in Jerusalem. So you see the risen Lord, you see Pentecost, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Because uh, some of you are like, you're not going to get by that easy. I know, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, is, but then you see persecution. Do you know how the word scatters? On people being persecuted. That's how it happens. Jesus is like, go. And they're like, man, we're having so I mean, these services are off the chain. I mean, this is great. Thousands of people being saved. Great. I didn't say you all all have one big party. I didn't say you'd have one big party. Go, 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 go. And they wouldn't go. Now, it's a good thing to all worship together. Be good. He's, and he finally brings in persecution and, and through Herod and different people. And eventually they go. Persecution. You see Stephen in Scripture. Stephen's one of my favorite Bible. I mean, you, you read and we'll look at it maybe a little bit. I'd love to get the whole time to it. I mean, this whole list here, you know, I even left off Philip and Ethiopian. I mean, you literally, what chapter do you like? You know, you could throw in there. Okay. Uh, but the Stephen's the first martyr uh, that you see there. You get the stoning of Stephen. You get his sermon that he's allowed to preach, all those different things. You see that. But secondly, under the outline, you get Christianity in Judea and in Samaria and Syria. Uh, that's also part of chapter 8 through verse 12. Uh, you get the conversion of Saul, Paul, however you want to do that there, Saul, and then you really get heavy in the persecution of Herod. I mean, Herod comes in with a heavy hand. And, and, and with that, and here, you know who Herod empowers? Saul. You know, Saul actually was given, because I don't mean to belittle it, we really do not know persecution in this country. Now, we've had some weirdness over the last few years, but Paul, Saul, was given the authority by Rome to drag men, women, and children out of their homes who claimed to have faith in Christ, kill them, beat them, throw them in prison, find them, do whatever you want. Nobody can touch you. I mean, in modern day, if we were meeting like this, Saul would have the authority to come in here, arrest us, drop a few of us, kill us right here. I mean, you imagine the tragedy that that is. See, a lot of times, I always say, don't read the Bible as a newspaper, okay? Read it, the idea of, I mean, the things that they had to do to meet, and sometimes the the little things that keep us from meeting and worshiping together. Now, I'm not going to work on that other people, but okay with that. But anyway, the third that you see Christianity to the uttermost parts of the earth, that's chapters 13, really, through 28. Uh, with that, you get all three of, of Paul's missionary journeys. Me and Wes were joking about that. He said, if you want to know exactly the detail of all the journeys, see him. He'll have to yeah, yeah. yeah, he'll give you total cities and background. And all that. No, but there's a lot of things there in that part. There's that council at Jerusalem, like I was telling you about. When they're just losing their minds, all these Gentiles are getting saved. And, and, and they're losing their mind. They're like, what are we going to do? And, and so this big thing, chapter 15, is all about that. And they're like, there's a group saying, they've got to be circumcised. They've got to stay away from this week. They've got to do these holy days. They've got to do this. They have to embrace Judaism. And then some of them, they watched some of them and interviewed some of them. And they basically come away saying, we can't do that to them. And their verdict was, no, it's, it's Christ. It's Christ plus nothing. And then, now again, they said, now don't eat things given up. You can't do this, can't do this. But they didn't say it's a part of salvation. There's a huge thing here. With that, and then Paul's journey to Rome, which is towards the end of the book, which is really, really great uh, there. So let's look at uh, key verses uh, for this. We've already read Acts 1.8. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I started going down the figure. I said, you know, I'm going to get three key verses, and I'm going to have a good day. I can't tell you verses I skipped. Uh, skipped. I mean, like the Philip, oh, Ethiopian eunuch, love that. Read it on your own. That's really good. 
<laughs> but anyhow, does somebody mind reading, uh, we're in Acts chapter 2. Uh, let's read, this is verses 37 and 38. Is that... Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What shall we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Repent, that each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Oh, what does she mind reading in that same chapter, uh, verse 42, and then 46 and 47? Uh, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And you said 46 and 47? Yes, sir. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the good will of all uh, you know, having the good will of all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. I mean, that's that's the result of Pentecost. I mean, the verse right above that, I believe it's verse uh, 41, talked about they had received the word baptized by 3,000 souls. Pretty good day. You know, with that. So, I mean, it's, you just see the effects of Pentecost, those different things. Like I said, we'll talk more about it deeply. But, like you said, you know, this idea when Peter preached, it says that what, what was the word you said there? Uh, Sorry, uh, verse 37. 37. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed. Yep. And he said, Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should I do, brother? Yeah. I mean, you imagine that? They were they were distressed. They were pricked to the heart. They were just so convicted. What do I got to do to be saved? What do I got to do to be saved? And that's not a ugly thing. That's a, I need this, I want this. Some of you have that testimony in here, I know. Uh, I've talked to some of you and been able to, you know, Stacey, I think about you automatic after the service walking up going, hey, just tell me what I got to do. Tell me what I got to do to be saved. Just wanted to be saved. You know, I want to say, well, according to the law of justification, no, 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 no. Is that's all about faith in Christ, you know. But you see how when they put faith in Christ, they didn't stop socializing together. I mean, they continued, it says in verse 2, learning the doctrines, learning the things like that. And it says they continued daily in one accord, breaking bread house to house. And, they, and it says that the Lord added to the church. That means, guess what? He's in charge of it. It's great. It's great when we don't have to get in the way of it. Anyhow, uh, and then next is this section here, chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, and also verse 20. Correct? Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, Doth this man stand here before you whole? This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 20. Oh, I'm sorry. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Thank you. So this is, this is Peter here speaking. And by the way, the first several chapters are a lot about Peter. Uh, he's known as the apostle or the missionary to the Jews. I mean, when you see it here, I mean, he just says it straight out, right? This, this is it. This is how you're saved. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. You see that same language with Paul later in Philippians. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you see, I love Peter's passion. Remember, the guy runs 100 miles an hour. If he runs the wrong way or right way, he says, we cannot help but speak of Peter and John. He says, we can't help but speak of We, I mean, what a wonderful blessing in looking at that. And then uh, Acts 5, 42, uh, Isaac. And every day in the temple went from the house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So what I wanted to let you know, if he says in daily there, uh, we've now moved our services to seven times. No, I'm kidding. Don't for that. No, this doesn't mean that they had service Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It means that they just gathered everywhere they could gather. If it was convenient to gather down at the temple, they gathered down at the temple. They gathered together in their homes. They did life together. That's what we're promoting here, community together. Is that we, whether it's preaching or teaching or just discipling people, is that they just didn't cease to do it. You know, they wanted to grow. They wanted to do that. It wasn't just a Sunday, fun day religion. To them. I mean, it was really such a magnificent thing there. Um, if we go to chapter 10, 
Uh, verses 39 and 40. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Thank you. So this is Peter still preaching. And do you notice what he's saying? Peter, the, the apostle to the, the Jews, he didn't necessarily say, you, you notice the words here? I mean, he said, excuse me, he said it like this, whom they slew and hung on a tree. He's like, you know, the Jews put him on the cross. But look what it says, God raised him on the third day. Showed him open. So you just, what are they really pushing? The resurrection, right? Because there's a group of people, uh, you may read this especially in the Gospels, called the Sadducees. And uh, you say, well, I don't care, Pharisees, Sadducees, Jebusees, whatever, Buckies, whatever, I don't care, whatever. <laughs> the Sadducees were people who said, Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, but Jesus didn't raise you. How sad is that? You see. Okay, you feel sad, you know, with that, right? I mean, the idea they're like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone says, my faith is in Jesus, his death on the cross. But you know what? There ain't no way he rose, rose from the dead. But see, it's talking about the witnesses. You ever wonder, he just rose from the dead, he didn't go right back to heaven. For 40 days, he was seen it. Uh, with that. So anyway, by the way, uh, a lot of people believe, and I'm kind of in this camp, that his brother James, to which we get the book of James. James wasn't, his brother wasn't a disciple until many believed after the resurrection. With that. You said, oh, there's James, a disciple. Different James. It's a different James. And, and so it's very interesting. Jude, little book of Jude, Jude, the brother of Jesus. I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting things, the time period that goes through there, and I don't want to steal thunder from that. Uh, but we'll go, keep on going through there. Uh, and then chapter 17, verse 6 and 11. Somebody mind reading that? Chapter 17, 6 and 11. Hey, thank you. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the boys, <coughs> shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And verse 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Thank you. So I have that underlined in almost every Bible I have. So this is the work at Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens, and all this stuff. And, and these are the, the anti-Jesus people saying, these guys are turning the world upside down. They come to our place. I mean, imagine that testimony and here comes these guys that are just totally making a revolution. And we're not talking about taking up arms revolution. I mean, these that are turning the world upside down are come here also. And then Berea. Uh, you probably have heard the term Bereans. Uh, I really believe Luke with Paul really gives the Berean church probably one of the greatest compliments. Yeah. And this is kind of, in my opinion, one of my bases personally for my preaching and teaching. He says they're more noble than any of them. You know why? Because they have a readiness of mind that but he did this, they search the scriptures daily, whether they be so it means this. They didn't just hear Paul, they didn't just hear Peter, they didn't hear Barnabas, they didn't just hear Silas and go, sounds good, like it, take it. And they said, Great, love that you preach that. Now where does it say that? And they searched it. They searched it. You ever sometimes think to yourself, man, I don't know why so and so just gets so caught up in that. Why do they get so caught up in that? Well, a lot of times they take the word of man instead of saying, what does say the Lord? I'll always encourage you to, if I'm wrong, come tell me I'm wrong. Be nice about it. You know, come tell me I'm wrong, you know, in that. But, uh, you know, just, just come, you know, try the, try the spirits the Bible says. Testify the word to see what it says. Now, we may differ on something like that. You're like, well, Bill, I don't really technically believe the name is Phil Pye. I believe it's Phil Pete. Whatever, whatever you want. I don't care. I did have somebody a long time ago come up to me uh, and say, long time ago, don't go to church, don't no part of church. Uh, but it come like, no says, well, you know something, preacher? It really wasn't Daniel in a lion's den. It was really Daniel in a den of lions because it's really a lot different. And I said, well, if you need that and that's all you got out of the message, Lord help you bless you and have a good one. You know, kind of thing like that. Um, you're like, if it's a den of lions, lions are present. If it's a lion's den, lions might not have been there. you got to really, I was like, if 
you want to do that, more power to you and enjoy it. Get warmed and filled over there. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> but in all seriousness, there's going to be things we don't agree on, right? Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, second, you know, whatever issue down the road. But there might be some important things, but at the end of the day, you know, it is who is Christ and what is salvation and, and a lot of the function, operation of things, just understand it and agree on that. And I've always said this, there's really only about four or five things that we really got to agree on to worship together. But, you know, there's really only about four or five things uh, with that. And it's not the color of carpet, uh, with that, or pews or chairs. But anyhow, you're like, I don't know what they are. Not that way. Uh, anyhow, uh, let's go on to the next one here. Where are we at? Uh, chapter number 20. Now, I got a lot of them in chapter number 20. I got, I got really bogged down in 20. Uh, verses 19 through 21. Somebody might read that. <laughs> Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and wait of the Jews, and how I kept forth nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from the house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So to give you a little context, this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. He started the church at Ephesus. Ultimately, to give you an idea, he is saying goodbye to them. Because he knows he's made the appeal that if he comes back in Jerusalem, they're going to kill him. The Jews are going to kill him. And, and so he's made his appeal for Roman. Somehow Paul had Roman citizenship, which allowed him an audience before Caesar. And so that took it out of the Jews' hands. And so, But what he's saying here to this is, how he served the Lord with him. He says, I didn't keep back anything from you. All those things. And, and uh, Brother John, if you don't mind reading there, uh, verse 27 and 31 also. All right, 27 and 10. <clears throat> For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Verse 31 says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Yeah. So again, like I thought about this morning, all Paul's a harsh man. Paul's this... A rough man, Paul's at three years he spent with him. Started the church there at Ephesus. He said, I warned you day and night. And he said, I didn't shun to tell you anything. Again, another one of those verses I take, and that's why I love to do expository, uh, where we go through the book and we do verse by verse, line upon line, because that means when I hit a verse that is not popular, like forgiveness, uh, we, uh, I got to speak it because it's there. You know what I mean? Can't go... So that way you can't think, well, Phil just decided today he wanted to preach that, or, or anybody. So it's just like, hey, it's there in the Bible. You just go through what the Bible says uh, with that. And he said, I, I didn't keep anything from you uh, with that. What a wonderful challenge that is. Uh, and then I somehow this came up with chapter 26. Um, a lot of verses there. But chapter 26, verses 18 to 20. And by the way, this is Paul before King Agrippa. a great passage of scripture. He goes for a lot of kings before he gets to uh, Caesar. But anyhow, does somebody mind reading that? 26, 18 to 20. Yes, sir. All right. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but shewed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. And then, uh, so am I reading with that, really, though, verse 27, 28? Okay. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I mean, imagine that. I mean, you can kind of see Paul's heart here. He says, Agrippa, I can see it on your face. I can see the Holy Spirit working on me. Don't you believe the prophets? Don't you believe what I just told you about Christ? And Agrippa, in that moment, says, Almost, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I heard someone say one time, I think it's pretty accurate, it says, that Agrippa almost went to heaven and went to hell. He almost made it to heaven, then he went fully into hell. 
because almost he was persuaded to be a Christian. Now some people say he's using sarcasm. I don't know. I'm just going off what the Bible says here. But I find it very, very, very interesting. Um, when you go back to the passage there, I don't know if some of you have this in your Bible. The earlier verses, Brother Doug read verse 18. I have those in red, yeah. which are the words of Christ. Which says what? To open the eyes and then to turn them from darkness. What? Darkness to light. That's, that's like screaming of John, right? You know, um, the power of Satan that they might get forgiveness of sins and all. And how does he say they are sanctified? Higher powers of by faith. By faith. And maybe this is a touchy topic. I don't think it is because I think it's pretty evident because John the Baptist said it. Jesus said it. What's the first thing you get out of John the Baptist? Repent for the kingdom of heaven and hands. What's the first thing you're Jesus in? Repent for the kingdom of heaven and hands. And so do you notice how Paul here says it's not enough to acknowledge Jesus, but you need to repent, to turn from your sins, go a different way. And that, which is, by the way, kind of goes to the same thing with faith without works is dead. It's not that works save you, but you truly have faith in Christ. You repent and you turn in those things. The reason I say that is because I have good friends that there's kind of this movement going of this idea that repentance is not needed for salvation. And I say, well, if you do that, man, you why did John the Baptist say that? Why did Jesus say that? Why does Paul say that? Repent. 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 We don't want to repent because I don't want to change, right? It almost goes into the Mars Hill thing. I'll take Jesus among other gods. It's one of my gods. It's not, he's not the God. And so anyhow, uh, I got a very close friend whom I love very dearly. Me and him differ on this. And I said, you really need to be careful, in my opinion, sharing the gospel. If you just say repentance is not needed, I, I'm really scared of how you're presenting the gospel. Because it is repentance. I mean, why did Christ die? There's nothing I need to repent of. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty, right? But anyhow. Uh, a lot of great things there. Uh, going to special features, I just kind of highlighted different things in the book. I know our time getting up. Uh, again, I'm sorry to get a little bit of Ethiopian Munich. Throw it in there. Get it, like it, do it. I'm not naming that for your video. But to give you a breakdown, the first 12 chapters, there's a lot of significant figures, like main characters. Peter, Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, James. Uh, James uh, becomes later the uh, kind of the pastor, the first pastor elder there at the church at Jerusalem. Um, but anyhow, but when you get to chapters 13 to 28, the dominant figure is Paul. I mean, Paul's the dominant figure, which again, it leads you to the what? It leads you out of the to Jerusalem, Judea, uttermost. And Paul starts going to the uttermost parts of the earth uh, with that. Uh, again, you see things about Jesus' ascension there in the first chapter. Um, and then you get something with today, Pentecost in chapter 2. I do want to just talk about that for a second. <laughs> Pentecost. Everybody's like, no, 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 no. We're so happy. Leave Pentecost alone. Uh, look at chapter 2. Okay? Look at chapter 2. And I got friends and loved ones on all this whole thing about Pentecost and tongues and all those things. But I wanted to read you some scripture, okay? Uh, with this. Okay? So. Chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, they were all with one accord in one place. And it's talking about the disciples. It says that suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So there you go, right there. That's the filling of the Holy Ghost. It says they began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when these, and now excuse me, now this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man, now I want you to see this, every man heard them speak in their own language. Okay. So again, if you feel a different way, that's fine. Tongues, what they got there, man, Peter, Paul, I mean, Peter and, and John, they stood up and talked in this kind of 
language, unknown language, like heavenly, I don't want to call it gibberish, but you know, they're taking something that's not a language going up, and they're just doing all that. So you have to understand at Pentecost, where Jerusalem is, you have a connection between Africa, Egypt, Africa. You have a connection between Asia. It's where people came. And I don't know if you noticed that. It says men, there were Jews, but people out of every nation under heaven. So they were there. They would trade. They would do different things. They were there for festival. Uh, if I can help you with this, it's like Mardi Gras on crack is what's going on at Pentecost. Okay? Pentecost is just a huge, huge party, and it's not all spiritual. Okay? And here in the midst of this, the Holy Spirit comes upon, and so these disciples stand up, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they start speaking. And the true reason I don't believe it's some unknown tongue, language, heavenly gibberish, gibberish. because if you hear what it said, verse 6, and every man heard in their own language. Best thing I've ever seen in my life as far as explaining this. When I was in Bible college, we had kids from all around the world. My Bible professor had explained this, Dr. Kaiser, who went on to be with the Lord years ago, took someone from Brazil, he says, Portuguese, go stand in that corner. He said, did anybody hear no French? The guy's like, didn't know French? He said, go stand in that corner. He says, great, you know Spanish. So didn't know that two years, didn't do me any good. Uh, he went stand in that corner over there, and he goes, anybody know German? Yep, German, you go over there. He's like, any other language, a couple of language popped up, go around, he says, all I want you to do, when I point to, is start reading John 3.16. And so the people start reading, and he said, just keep reading John 3, 16. Just keep reading for God's sake. Just keep reading. But read it in that, in that tongue. And he let them read about three times, and then he did. He walked to the middle of the room and very quietly said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he stopped there when he said, For you in here that speak English, which one did you gravitate to? Your own language. That's what Pentecost was. That's what Pentecost was. And it says in every man. And, and here's why they're fascinated. Here's why the guys are going nuts. Because it goes on down in here in verse 8. It says, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we're born? Verse 7 says, And they're all amazed and marvel, saying, One another, Well, are not all these which speak Galileans? That's not a compliment. Aren't these a bunch of dumb redneck fishermen? How in the world do they know? And you see verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, other hard words, all down through there, okay? They spoke all these languages which they didn't study, no Rosetta Stone, none of that stuff that happened, and they all heard in their own language because God gave it to them in that. Now again, if you land on the other side of that, I love you, I will fellowship with you, I will break bread with you. But I just feel like if we really understand and read Scripture, Scripture explains it. Uh, with that. And it says they're all amazed. Say, what meaning is this? And look what this one. So verse 30, you always got this group right. Others make fun of them, mock them, says they're full of new wine. There's a bunch of drunk dudes. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, I guess if I get drunk and I can learn German and French, okay, I'm not saying I should drink, but anyhow. Some of y'all are like, I needed a way to do it. Never <laughs> So, uh, but anyhow, some other fascinating things. Uh, you see kind of a purging in the church? Sort of Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 5. Do you remember about that? It was not, can I tell you, it was not because of the king. It's because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And they deceived the Holy Spirit. They deceived people. They lied to the Holy Spirit. So that's great. The deacons, there was, uh, that's in chapter number 6. I always find this funny. Uh, you know, you meet churches that have whatever, they have 50 people, 100 people, and they got 24 deacons. At the beginning, church had 3 to 5,000 people at 7, so if you do math, but then again, I think that's descriptive, it's not prescriptive, it doesn't mean, well, you need one deacon for every 340 seconds. I don't think it means, excuse me, means that, but I'm just always kind of humorous because I'm sarcastic. Uh, but you see the idea of what deacons are, by the way? You see the idea of what they were meant to be, servants. It says, why should we leave the word to go serve tables? We have so many widows. We have so many people in need, so many people hungry, so many need. He said, let's set out seven men who are holy. The Bible talks about Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, filled with those different ones. And you know what they did? Their whole purpose was this. Peter, James, you study the word. You get up and preach and teach it. 
let us take care of loving people and doing that. And really that was the purpose of it uh, with that. Of course, you get the stoning of Stephen, you get his whole sermon, and, uh, and then his death, which by the way, if you read chapter 7 at the end, it said, I want to read that tonight, it's, just, it's so gripping. It talks about when they stoned Stephen. It says, and they laid down their coats at a young man's feet before they stoned him, Saul. whose name was Saul. Mm -hmm. I always wonder the impact that the Apostle Paul had by watching and smiling as Stephen was stoned to death. The impact that had. You want to talk about the opportunity for regret and just, just depression. I mean, imagine what his heart, I mean, imagine the effect of that on Paul. I mean, to me, it's just so gripping when you think about that. Uh, of course, you get Saul's conversion. Saul, Paul, conversion in chapter 9. You get Cornelius. Is, uh, Cornelius is a Gentile. Uh, and then Peter's vision together. That's in chapter 10. Remember, Peter was still kind of hung up on all this Jewish thing. I can't do that. He's up on a rooftop. God drops his big sheet down with all these animals that Jews aren't allowed to eat. And Jesus says, eat it. And he said, famous line of Peter. Not so, Lord. Not going to happen. I'm like, yeah, no, not for Jesus. And he's like, what I say is clean, don't you call it unclean. So he eats it, and next you see Peter going and leading this Gentile the Lord, the Macedonian vision with Paul, come help us, come show us Christ. Uh, Paul and Silas in the jail, uh, that Philippian jailer, if you would, uh, you remember that situation. By the way, when you get to chapter 16, you got, you got the conversion of the jailer, you've got Lydia, the woman, that's very wealthy to do. We'll get into this when we do Philippians, probably the first sermon. And then you got the demon possessed girl, and that's how the church at Philippi got started. A ruthless jailer, a very well to do businesswoman, and a demon possessed girl. Let's start a church. Okay? All right. It's really great. You get the beginning of it in chapter 16. Chapter 17, you get the Sermon on Mars here, Hill, where he goes, and there's this big. Uh, altar there that says to the unknown God just in case we missed anybody yeah. and, then, and then Paul talks about who that is uh, of course he's, some of the things we just read about the Ephesian church about him leaving those different things you get Paul's arrest in chapter number 21 and then chapter 27 20 is some of my favorite ones if you just like stories uh, Paul talks about being shipwrecked he's on the journey to Rome and, and they're shipwrecked they're all losing their minds Paul's a prisoner and so the boat starts to break. I mean, he's like, don't worry, guys, we're going to make it. And so here's the prisoners saying, don't worry, we're going to make it. And while he gets to the island of Malta, uh, he's, they all get on the island. They're all drenched from everything. And he goes and picks up sticks and says, the snake comes out. Then the snake bites him on the hand. So he shakes it off and into the fire. And they're all thinking he's a god. Because he's a drop. They're like, oh, what a simple man. He's going to die because he got bit by a bit of a snake. He doesn't die. Oh, man, he's God. And so, which... I would have probably said the same thing too. We're going to see that. But uh, what you don't see in it, what you go into Paul's life, and that's why I want to give you the timeline next week. It ends in Acts there, but it ends up what's happening, and I'll probably talk about this again in 2 Timothy. Paul finally gets to go to Rome. He appeals to Rome. And what happens is kind of tremendous. I truly believe with all of my heart, Paul appeals to Caesar. Got him from Felix and Agrippa. He gets to go to Caesar. I truly believe Paul got to preach the gospel in front of Caesar. Now, he was executed. He did not live. But I just, you know, the things that in the life of Paul and those people, but just kind of amazing things there. But, um, and that's about the shortest summary I can give you on the book of Acts. And, and uh, just go ahead and pray now about Romans. Um, does anybody have questions or comments or anything? I always want to give the opportunity with that. There's something you want to say. Again, I'm just your regular person. I am really sorry. And that uh, there, there are people here. There's a, there's a woman named Lucas. I love that name. That's the chief engineer. Raised from the dead. I mean, there's a lot of great things that happen in here. But, uh, uh, great. I think it's amazing that the Council of Jerusalem, this early in the church, we already have divided ourselves into two different groups of, well, we're, we're, they may be Christians, but we're better than them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they don't do things exactly the way we do them, so therefore we can't associate with them, and maybe we'll let them be teaching Christians, but 
you know, it's amazing how early in this our flesh already got in the way. This perfect church, this brand new Holy Spirit, this miraculous thing can already be found a way to divide ourselves, make ourselves less effective. And what time was spent there that could have been spent, oh, yeah. you know, on production? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You already see what Satan's trying to do with all of you. And well-meaning people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you being here tonight. And again, I know there's a lot going on. I uh, appreciate y'all praying for us. We'll be leaving Tuesday night late and driving to Murfreesboro. I got the funeral for my great aunt at 10 o'clock Wednesday morning uh, there. Um, my other aunt, uh, Audrey Snyder, as of today, she is sleeping a lot. And uh, I think pretty much quit eating. And so I don't know exactly how long I'll be gone. I'm going to be bouncing back and forth. But I appreciate you praying for us. I don't know if you going on too. We'll be praying for you. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, Greg is going to actually present, kind of, oh, present, but he's going to, you know, he's going to take the service for us and talk about what's happening and what they've been doing lately and what they're doing going ahead. So I encourage you to come to that. Um, I know we've been doing different topics on Wednesday nights and stuff. So when I get back on Wednesday night, the next one, because some of you asked, I, I enjoy looking at topics. Uh, the one we're going to look at next time that I'm here on Wednesday, hopefully a week and a half, we're going to look at waiting on God. When you, know, when you have to wait on God for answers and things in your life. But anyhow, uh, but we'll pray. Somebody might pray for us as we go. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this uh, wonderful night of fellowship with these dear brothers and sisters and going through this historic uh, book of Acts covering the New Testament, Lord God, in the beginning of the Christian faith, Lord. And I just pray that we would all take what was taught and meditate on it, Lord, and that we would just uh, do some more uh, research and looking into it ourselves just to help us to grow in our faith, Lord God, that we'd be able to share it with other people. And as the Scripture says, being able to give the reason of hope that lies within us. I thank you, Father, and pray to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And by the way, if you did, one of the people that did want to uh, come over today, I got a little something for you, so we'll see you for you. Congratulations. For those of you in the obviously, I don't want to keep anybody here, but for those that might be curious, I'll ask you a question. How do you explain the salvation without repentance? Your friend has to explain it. Can you, do that explain it? Can you do that in two minutes? Yes. Yeah. He, says, <laughs> he claims Romans uh, 10, 13, Bruce shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you just pray out to God, save me. Right. Now, believe you died on the cross, save me. Right. You don't have to necessarily repent of sin. And I'm like, a lot of scripture explains that. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, but I'm like even the verse that we read, one of them says Peter's response was, if you repent now, then you get the baptism part of that. Repent and be baptized. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, there you go, so you need to be baptized, which again is not showing that baptism is needed mm -hmm. for salvation. If you understand that some people believe that baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so you get yeah, that's the thing. All you got to do is call upon him. You just got to say, God save me. I'm not your God. Save me. So that, to me, is an acknowledgement, not necessarily. That's, 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 I don't know if that's helpful or not. But that, that's the verse they use. That.